Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank the Upskill Board to, to invite me to tell you something about brain changes in chronic pain and the neuropathic assessment quantitative sensory testing. My name is Sabrina Klerks and I work as a physiotherapist, manual therapist at a hospital in Utrecht at the Pain Device, where I collaborate closely with anesthesiologists. In addition uh, to my clinical practice, I also lecture at the University of Applied Sciences. And I am pursuing a PhD at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, utilizing my expertise as a clinical epidemiologist to contribute to research in the field. Um, So uh, when examining the definition of pain provided by the International Association for the Study of Pain, uh, we can observe that it encompasses both sensory and emotional aspects, as well as actual or potential tissue injury. So now the question arises, how do we effectively signal, interpret and respond to these different components? And so the story begins. This model shows simplified the concept of pain and I would like to use these terms to place in this model transduction, transmission, modulation, distribution of nociceptive input and decoding message from nociceptive signs. While placing those terms into the model uh, would look like this. When the signal arrives in the brain, the thalamus decides to transport the signal when prioritized and the decoding of the signal in the brain starts. So as Butler says, uh, the question is, um, is it a danger in me or is it a safety in me? Do I have to prioritize the signal or not? And pain can be understood and characterized uh, within various dimensions. Uh, three of which are commonly recognized are uh, the first cognitive evaluative dimension. This dimension involves the cognitive processes and evaluations associated with pain perception. And it encompasses the thoughts, beliefs and cognitive appraisal of the pain signal. So the prefrontal cortex plays a significant, significant role in processing and analyzing this dimension of pain. The second one is the affective motivational dimension. And it focuses on the emotional and motivational aspects of pain. It involves the subjective feeling and emotional responses that accompany the pain signal. And these emotional components can vary widely, ranging from distress, fear, anxiety, frustration, sadness, or relief. The affective motivational dimension influences an individual's motivation to seek relief or take action to alleviate the pain. And the sensory discriminative dimension. And it relates to the aspects of pain like uh, perception. It encompasses the sensory qualities and characteristics of the pain signal, such as location, duration, and intensity. And this dimension involves the brain's ability to distinguish and identify the sensory attributes of the pain, such as sharpness, throbbing, burning, sensations. By understanding these three dimensions of pain, healthcare professionals can gain a comprehensive perspective on the subjective experience to further help us as therapists understand the pain uh, from the patient, so where it's coming from, we have to know first how to classify the pain. So first, nociceptive pain. Nociceptive pain can uh, be seen as pain due to damage to non-neural tissue, clear pro proportional specific localized pain, usually intermittent and sharp with mechanical provocation. Testing nociceptive pain can be conducting using criteria, uh, a pain questionnaire, provocating and sedating the pain, uh, uh, looking at the pain area and duration after provocation. Neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is a specific type of pain that arises from dysfunction or damage to the nervous system itself. It is caused by abnormalities or malfunctions in the peripheral nerve, spinal cord or brain. The causes are, for example, nerve compressions, conditions such as herniated disc or carpal tunnel syndrome, and nerve injuries, so traumatic injuries, and, and diseases or disorders like diabetic neuropathy. And nerve uh, uh, injuries can disrupt the normal transmission of signals along the affective nerves, nerves. And abnormal regrowth or reorganization of nerve fibers can lead to abnormal signaling and pain sensations. 
So symptoms um, are like sensor, sensory abnormalities, or, uh, so neuropathic pain is characterized by abnormal sensory experiences. Uh, it may manifest as shooting or electric shock-like pain, burning or tingling sensation, uh, but also numbness, hypersensitivity like allodynia or heightened sensitivity to stimuli, hyperalgesia. And the pain can follow a dermatomal distribution and can be provoked by neurodynamic tests. For further classifying the reliable and valid questionnaire, Douleur Neuropathie 4 can be used, uh, which contains uh, two questions to be answered by the patient and two questions uh, that have to be answered by the therapist. Well, besides testing reflexes, the dermatomal and myogenic distribution, and using neurodynamic tests, the quantitative sensory testing battery can be used to quantify functions of the somatosensoric system into gain or loss of function. It is a set of standardized tests uh, that assess various sensory functions in individuals. So it involves measuring and quantifying sensory responses to different stimuli, such as temperature, pressure, vibration, or me mechanical stimuli. And QST, also called uh, so quantitative sensory testing, can be used for several purposes. Uh, so overall, uh, a quantitative sensory testing battery serves as a valuable tool in clinical practice research and treatment planning for assessing sensory function, objectively diagnosing sensory disorders, guiding therapeutic interventions, and improving, improving patient care. And on the slide, you can see an example of the vibrations for the beta fibers, temporal summation, like wind-up phenomenon uh, for the ad, delta and C fibers and the pressure pain threshold, threshold with an algometer um, and conditioned pain modulation for the ad, delta and C fibers. So creating a clinical sensory testing battery because previous was for laboratory uh, settings used. So creating a clinical sensory testing battery is of great interest due to the significant amount of time and money the laboratory QST battery costs. And so consequently, various materials have undergone evaluations to assess their reliability and construct validity for this purpose. And here you can see um, some examples on the slide. So um, there are a few studies that have assessed and conducted um, investigations. And what we see is moderate, uh, overall moderate correlations between the laboratory QST and the CST, so the clinical version. They are mainly um, investigated in people with uh, neuropathic pain. Um, now I want to talk further about how to translate that done into chronic pain. So how do we measure in chronic pain? And first for, uh, about the chronic pain. So it's said uh, that pain, it is pain of at least three months duration. But a lot of things happen. So multiple aspects, aspects occur and are present in chronic pain. And what we see in this slide is, is some examples. So S1, the primary somatosensory cortex, gets more activation. And S2, the secondary somatosensory cortex, gets a bilateral coactivation with S1. The anterior cingulate cortex, also with the uh, um, with the affective motivational dimension, uh, gets bilateral and more right activation. And the insula also uh, plays a part with suffering, experiencing suffering, gets a widespread activation. But because a lot of signals are coming from the periphery, it has to play a role in sensory discrimination as well. We also see that the prefrontal cortex gets in a hyperactivated state. So different aspects and factors, um, as thoughts and emotions, can modulate the brain, resulting in facilitation or innovation. And that's what you see on these uh, illustrations. So the black lines demonstrate the possibilities in uh, modulation. Central sensitization pain. Um, so central sensitization pain is also a neurophysiological mechanism defined as amplification of neural signaling within the central nervous system that elicits pain hypersensitivity. And to zoom in 
um, we can look at these pictures, uh, but also central sensitization is also called for the temporal summation or wind of phenomenon. So an, uh, when an identical stimulus following an initially painful stimulus is experienced as even more painful. And a lot of things happen, um, but I hope to show you uh, some things on these pictures. So the activation of the NMDA receptors leads to a process called neural sensitization, um, which what you can see on the left picture uh, uh, under the blue tube, uh, so the iron channel. This process involves changes in the properties of the neurons, making them more responsive uh, to pain signals. It also involves recruitment of additional neurons to transmit pain signals. An increased pain sensitivity as the Weiner phenomenon on uh, on progresses, the, the spinal cord becomes more sensitive to pain signals and the threshold for pain perception is lowered and even mild or non-painful stimuli can be perceived as painful. And what you see also on the right picture uh, illustration is that um, it induces release of peptides and glutamate produce of re uh, and recruitment of receptors. And sustained discharge recruits the N NMDA receptors, which what you also can see here on the picture. And it produces sensitization of secondary neurons, so higher frequency when recruited by nociceptors, hyperalgesia, and non nociceptor stimulation, allodynia. So how to measure that in practice? Um, so the temporal summation, wind of phen phenomenon. Uh, you can see in this picture a pinprick, so it's uh, a senile which um, is placed on the skin, not in the skin, so it's places on the skin, and um, you test the A delta and C fibers with it. So on the left you can see the pinprick used in a laboratory-wise setting, and on the right you can see an example uh, from the clinical sensory testing. And here uh, from free monofilament is used, the thickest one. But you can also use a, a, a tooth prick or um, from the two point discrimination uh, point. Uh, so, what you do is you first apply one um, prick and wait for 10 seconds and then apply 10 pricks as a train. And then you ask for the MPRS for both. You can calculate the ratio or subtract them from each other. Nosy plastic pain. Um, when objectifying pain, it is important to distinguish between nociplastic pain and central sensitization pain. In chronic pain, central sensitization does not have to be present. So when we look in this table, you can see both have three months duration of pain. Um, but you can see in the central sensitization pain, it's more diffuse uh, than noci in nociplastic pain. And also the nociceptive mechanisms and the neuropathic mechanisms, mechanisms are excluded in central sensitization pain, but uh, not entirely explained in nociplastic pain, which are uh, differences. Nociplastic and CSI, so nociplastic pain and CSI. So the central sensitization inventory is often completed by patients in clinic. And besides looking at the threshold, which might tell us central sensitization is present, we have to look at the separate answers given. While some of the answers are similar to criteria of nociplastic pain. And when it comes to objectifying pain, it involves asking specific questions about different aspects of the pain experience. For example, you can inquire about the response to a stimulus, the duration of pain, and the area affected to assess allodynia. You can ask questions like, how does it feel when your sweat glides on your skin? And this question aims to determine the pain response triggered by a typically non-painful stimulus, such as the gentle contract of fabric against the skin. And by gathering information about the sens sensation experience during specific interactions, you can better understand the presence and char characteristics of the pain, in this case, allodynia. So in nociplastic pain, um, we are now trying to, and uh, one research before did as well, try to examine um, the reliability of the clinical sensory testing battery uh, to use in clinic. Um, then I want to talk about con condition pain modulation. So condition pain modulation can be utilized to assess the functionality of the endogenous pain modulation system. 
procedure involves conducting three baseline pressure pain thresholds with an algometer measurement. Following this, the participant immerses their right hand in cold water, in, in our research right hand, but you have to bring a an, um, um, pain experience, so that induces pain. And then the objective is to evaluate the modulation of pain through descending influences. And this test enables the measurement of both pain inhibition and pain facilitation. This is also shown here on, in the illustration on the right. In chronic pain, brain changes as cortical reorganization of the somatosensory cortex and the primary motor cortex have been reported. And in a clinical setting, it is commonly observed that normal movement exhibits a certain degree of variability. However, when pain is present, this variability tends to alter as individuals try to find ways to move that minimize, minimize or avoid pain. So, so subsequently, um, the range of movement variability decreases. And it's important to note that this, this issue cannot be resolved solely in the peripheral or affected body part, but requires changes to be made in the cortex. The somatosensory cortex in our brain represents our body and how we perceive and use it. When certain parts of our body area are manipulated or restricted, such as taping two fingers together, uh, these changes are also reflected in the brain. This is because the somatosensory cortex contains a precise map or representation of our body, known as the somatotopic map. When two fingers are taped together, the representation of those fingers in the somatosensory cortex may undergo alterations. Some cells related to the taped fingers may become inhibited, while others may become facilitated. This means that the acti activity of certain neurons responsible for processing sensory information from those fingers is either dampened or enhanced. And in the context of chronic pain, changes in the somatosensory cortex can occur. When pain persists over a prolonged period, the cells surrounding the facilitated cells in the somatosensory cortex may become disinhibited. As a result, the representation of the affected body part in the somatosensory cortex may become less distinct or vague. And here is a simplified illustration where the vagueness is visualized, also called smudged or out of focus. To objectify cortical reorganization of the primary motor cortex, different outcomes can be used. And two of the most common outcomes for mapping the organization are location and area, from where a motor evoked potential can be elected. And here you can see what across the location from uh, um, from the organization and the area from the muscle that is elected from stimulating the cortex. The transcranial mag magnetic stimulation is used to study cortical activity by applying a magnetic coil above the head. And muscle responses are captured using EMG, creating a 3D map. In comparing healthy individuals and those with low back pain, the map shows different muscle locations in healthy individuals, but similar location in low back pain cases. And this suggests all those cortical representations in low back pain. And here you can see, so the coils are put above the head, um, an electric field in, is induced and a synapses is its way down. And then a motor evoked potential can be, measured, can be um, captured with electromyography and a map can be made. So to obtain me precise measurements and conduct analysis, an individual's MRI, MRI scan can be performed. The MRI images is then segmented to create a 3D representation, which is subsequently incorporated into a navigation system. And this process allows for accurate visual visualization and navigation during the measurements. So this is my setup of measurements during my research. But how to bring the, this fundament uh, all, uh, as construct to the clinic? Well, I spoke about a change in movement variability in people with pain. And to assess motor precision, a study was conducted where a tracking task was performed. Low back pain patients reveal larger areas than healthy participants. A low-tech setup was designed to be suitable in a clinical setup, so we did that in our research. 
We then measured the reliability, and the reliability and setup of the spiral tracking test supports its feasibility for clinical use. Sensory discriminative testing. Lastly, I would like to inform you about two tests to measure sensory discrimination. One of these tests is the two-point discrimination threshold, where the distance of two points is measured that a participant could identify. Two instruction videos of this test uh, are available on your site, one for the therapist and one for the patient. Another test to assess sensory discrimination is the gravastasia test. Here the participant is asked to recognize the numbers drawn on the back. In our study, we piloted this with numbers and measured the reliability. Our study demonstrated that a good ICC value with a relative narrow 95% confidence interval and the measurement errors are reported on the slide. Um, so, a topic which I love, a lot to tell and there is of course much more to tell. For now, I hope to have informed and inspired you. Best of all, bye.